All right, let's get into this. I, I want to share a word with you before I preach. Um, but b- before I do that, um, you can turn in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 139, verses 23 through 24. You can get prepared. That's where I'm going to land here in just a moment. But um, that's Psalms chapter 139. Just go there and you'll find it here in a little bit. But uh, last Sunday, um, during our pre-service prayer, um, somebody gave a word. Uh, they saw a picture of camels lining up at the door uh, coming into our church. And, uh, you know, whenever, whenever, like, you're in prayer, let me just preface this with this. Maybe you're not quite sure when I say these things what that really means, okay? But sometimes during prayer, some people get some picture images, some, some thoughts, some people like to call them visions, X, Y, Z, those kinds of things. We have to understand first that we are um, not human beings having a spiritual experience, that we are spirit beings having a human experience, Right? And, and we actually are more supernatural than you really think that you are. Right? Because inside of you lives the spirit. It's the thing that goes to heaven or the other place. And, and, and it, is, it is a thing that communicates with God. And so sometimes God likes to communicate in the way that some people understand. And so during our pre-service prayer uh, last week, um, someone got an image of some camels lining up outside of the door. And uh, getting ready to come in, and, and uh, nobody really quite understood what that really meant. Nobody really knew uh, what that meant. Um, and then uh, later on uh, that afternoon, uh, somebody sent a message to Pastor Deb and then, then to me, okay? And it says, and it says this, um, this word that they found in more of a definition, an explanation of what the camels meant. Now listen to this. This is so great. We have entered the new Hebrew month of Savan, it says. It's a month of extravagant provision. In this month, we see that the Hebrew letter of the calendar is Gimel, which is a picture of a camel. In Bible days, when you saw a camel coming your way, that meant provision. God, is, God has lavish gifts to give us, two humps full of both, both physical and spiritual provision. So what does this mean for us? It means supply is on its way. So in this month, clear out some space, make room for God to fill your barns. Now, yeah, when we think that, we think, oh, great, you know, new house, new this, new that. I want you to know that we're coming into a season um, in our church and in your personal lives. I believe this, and I believe this is very God sent. I don't think it's just for us. I think it's, I think it's a global thing, to be honest with you, that God's doing with the church, that we're coming into a season right now of provision. The things where maybe you might have lacked in, the things that maybe you've um, been asking God for, I, I think that, I, I believe that Lord, the Lord is going to open up those doors for you as you pray, as you seek him first in his kingdom, right in his righteousness, Matthew 6.33. As you do that, I believe that we're going to see the provision in our lives. Now, how many of you guys would agree with that word and say, so be it, Lord, let it be in my life, right? In Deuteronomy, just to give you a scriptural reference to it. Deuteronomy chapter 28, it said, The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. So I'm excited for this next season. Right? I'm excited. When I say season, I'm not talking about just summer or things like that. I'm talking about this this new place that God is bringing his people into. We're walking. Look, we might be walking around in the wilderness sometimes, but make no mistake about it. God's going to provide manna for you. Right, he's going to provide the water and the rock. He's going to provide those things where you got to cross the Red Sea. Don't worry about the Red Sea and what it looks like. God just says strike, and you'll see the thing split. Because we're going to see a provision upon the church and upon the people of God. Like I, I, I and I believe this. Like we're going to move into a realm where people are going to go, "How are they blessed, and how are we not?" And I think it's because. God is moving us into a place where we're going to see the barns full. Amen? I can't wait to share with you some testimonies that have gone um, on in our, in our church. Um, I can't share them quite yet, but I will. I'll, I'll have liberty to do that soon. Um, but um, I'm excited to, 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 uh, to, to share this with you. God is really blessing us right now. Amen? Amen. So let's pray together with that, okay, if we can. And if you agree with that. Let's just take it for yourself as a word of faith and say, this is for me. Father, we just uh, agree with what you're speaking over over our life, over our seasons in our life right now. Jesus, we thank you. 
Lord, for what you're doing. God, we thank you for your heart. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you, Lord, that you're going to fill our barns, God, without us even really working that much for it, Jesus, because we believe that grace is abundant. Lord, and you're going to have it for our lives. God, we honor you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I just, just I got to share this real quick. I just feel this in my heart that there, I believe there's one, one person here that is really going through a tough, tough, tough season. Maybe there's multiple, but I really just sense one that you don't know how you're going to get out of this. I want you to know that this is the time for you. This is the time for you, okay? Don't waste it away um, um, where you lack faith. Okay, surround yourself with people who have faith, and God is going to help you get through this next phase of your life. It's going to help you get through this next phase of your life. In Jesus' name. It may seem impossible. Hear me. It may seem impossible. You may look out in front of you and go, how am I going to get rid of this in my life? How am I going to get rid of this in my life? But I want you to know that it's time. It's time. God's going to walk you through that. The camels are at your doorstep. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay. Well, let's get into the word now. All right. Um, today, I've been, I've been walking you guys through, just I started last week. Um, this is going to, the, the end of this little mini series is what I'm calling it. It's called Deeper Life. And uh, I've been walking you through some very practical steps uh, for us to have a more, uh, a deeper, more meaningful life. Now, just by a show of hands here, how many of you guys desire just a deeper, more meaningful life? Yeah, me too. I mean, we, we all should. And uh, in, in, in a lot of the times what people, just the average person, what they think, what they think is it just automatically happens to you. Okay, you just, you just hope that it happens. I want you to know that in order to ha- be different, you have to do different. Okay, you have to do things differently in order to have different outcomes in your life. And if you just think things are just going to happen to you, I want you to know that they're probably not because God loves to co-labor with you. He loves to work with you on these certain things. And so he wants to walk with you in, these, uh, in this thing called a deeper, more meaningful life. Now, when we talk about deeper, more meaningful life, I can say that, and there's, been, there's probably a lot of definitions of what that is for your life, okay? More money, more this, more that, more time at the lake, which, you know, I'm in favor of. Um, more time, more time doing this, you know, or whatever the case is, right? Um, um, all those things. But the reality is, is that, is that the Lord sometimes, what he loves to do is he loves to take us to these parts in our lives and our seasons where we have to work some stuff out. Okay, where we have to work some stuff out with him, and that in return could be what you need in your life to make it deeper and more meaningful. Okay, it may not be what we want, but it's definitely what we need. Okay, does that make sense? All right. So, so we have to be extremely intentional about it. Today, I want to talk to you guys about boundaries, creating and maintaining healthy boundaries in your life, creating and maintaining. How many of you guys ever heard that before? I'm not going to cross that. Like, that's, like I, got, I got boundaries, yo. Sorry, my gangster just came out a little bit, okay? I got, I got boundaries, right? I'm not going to cross that boundary. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about what boundaries are And what they're not, and we're going to talk about how to create and maintain some of those boundaries because boundaries are important in your life. Boundaries are extremely important, okay, in your life. But sometimes I think we can get it skewed a little bit on what those boundaries really look like and what they really mean. Okay, so a boundary, according to your dictionary in the Webster's, it says is a line that marks the limits of an area. Okay? It's a line that marks the limits of an area. So you got a boundary. Here's my boundary. It's this line. Okay? This is my space. This is your space. I know where I start and I know where I end. And you should know where you start and where you end. This is what a boundary is. And so many of us use this word boundary, and I used to use this too. It only meant if I didn't want to do something. Or if I wanted to get out of something. No, that's, a, that's okay. That's crossing my boundary. I'm just asking you to tell somebody about, no, no, no. I don't, I don't do that. That's, you know, that's, out of, out, that's outside of my boundaries. Okay? <laughs> well, let me, let me encourage you with something. That's not really a boundary. That's a limit that you put on yourself. Okay? When God begins to press you with something that you're uncomfortable comfortable with, it's because he's pressing you because he thinks you can do those things. Okay? And if you reject what he says, and if you reject the challenges from the Lord, right, you'll find yourself back in the same place. Look, God started with manna, but he doesn't want to leave you with manna, right? He wants to move you from place to place. The Bible puts it very clear that his mercies are what? New every morning, 
right? And then we move from glory to glory to glory, right? And some of us have been in a spot for a very long time in our walk with God because we're not willing to cross the uncomfortable line that God's asking us to cross. That's not a boundary, okay? Boundaries aren't there to not do something. They are for me to take personal responsibility for myself. That's what a boundary is. I live in a neighborhood, well, I've got two neighbors right now and whom, whom I love with all my heart. Facetiously, no, I do, I do. <laughs> Where they love, and I don't know if this is, maybe some, maybe some of you 50 plusers can help me with this because I'm about four years away from 50, right? Um, is it something where, like, the older you get, the more you mow your lawn? Is that, is that what I have to look forward to? <laughs> right? I'll tell you, man, these two neighbors, specifically one on my left side, uh, loves to mow his lawn. I know he's retired, um, and it's really cool. He's got an airplane in his garage. I, I don't know how he fits it in there, but he does. And it's just super cool. I love, I love my neighbors. Um, they're, not, they're not very talkative to me, even though I try to be, but uh, it's okay. And I'm telling you, that guy's out there mowing his lawn, you know, twice a week, sometimes three times a week, right? And me, I go, who can I hire to mow my lawn today? <laughs> oh, man, let's go. <laughs> okay, Rick, Rick, what are you doing this weekend? I say, I, it's like, it's like I, I get home and I go, Hey, why don't you just kind of just squeeze on over to my yard real quick and just, uh, 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 you know, it's just a little line, you know, it's okay. But you should see the line between his house and my house. It's like super green and well taken care of. And then there's one line that's like the other side of that, which is my yard, right? Which is like, you know, a, a little like your guys' lawn, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's not quite as manicured as, as they say. Right, and uh, it's really noticeable. And and what, I remember one time during Caleb's graduation, um, um, and I don't know if this guy was just being a bad neighbor or not. I'm still trying to discern this, but it's, I should let it go, right? I need to go on the counter and just let the stuff go. It's <sighs> another commercial for you. Um, um, we were out there having graduation party. Kids were throwing the football on our side of the lawn. But for some reason, he just thought it would be cool just to get his lawnmower out and just start mowing the lawn right when we're outside having food, hanging out. And me and the dude fired up his lawnmower. You know, and I'm just like, come on, man. And I, Kristen had to hold, not hold me back. It's not like I was going to fight this dude, right? But she, she had to hold me back, you know, because I use my words for a living. I can say some stuff. So I had to practice the fruit of the Spirit called self-control, and, uh, and I did, and I said, well, okay, I'll give him this. He's taking care of his lawn, I should take care of mine, right? He's taking care of his lawn, I should take care of mine. Now, for me to think that he's going to come over and cut my grass and make my yard look like his yard, okay, that just sounds crazy, doesn't it? Doesn't that just sound crazy? Yeah. Right? It just sounds like, why, 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 why would I have an expectation for my neighbor to come over and cut my yard? Now, if he was a good neighbor, he would. Let's just put that out there. Right? But, but, but why would I have an expectation for that to happen? And unfortunately, in our relationships and a lot of the things, what we do is that's how we think about our boundaries. We think that that other person is responsible for me, for my yard. We think the person you're in relationship with or you're in connection with is responsible for how I feel. Right? We think, we think if my neighbor would just learn how to manage my side, then both of our yards will look really great. The reality is this, is that you have a responsibility over your yard and he has a responsibility over his and I cannot expect that person to come over and manicure my lawn. Right, And that's how it is in our relationships, in our, re in our connections with people, is that we expect other people to make us happy. Even your spouse, come on somebody. Right, If you're relying on your spouse to make you happy, you're going to be relying a long time. Because we all know that power for people, happiness is an inside job. You need to take care of the lawn inside of your heart. 
See, in the Christian world, we get it mixed up a lot of the times, and we're really not sure where we end or where we begin. And we think, we think when we, when, when, when we find out that line where that is, we think we're being unkind, but really we're either being codependent or we're being enablers. And we actually need to be able to be very clear on who we are and who we are not. On who we are and who we are not. So boundaries are very important. What they do is allows us to define where you begin and where I begin, where you end and where I end. If you own your property, it's yours. You have control over your own property. Everyone catching what I'm laying down? You've got control over your own property. And some of the powerlessness you feel in your life is because you are blaming other people for what's happening in your life. And you will get powerful when you stop handing over your power to what someone has done to you and realize they are not responsible for you. Amen. Did I just hear that? That's, my, that's like the preacher's dream when someone says, say it again, pastor. I'm doing it. But I have to start from the beginning. Some of the powerlessness you feel in your life is because you are blaming other people for what's happening in your life. And you will get powerful when you stop handing over your power to what someone has done to you and realize they are not responsible for you. They're not responsible for you. My wife is not responsible for me. My, <laughs> that's what a preacher doesn't want to hear from their wife, right? So, <laughs> Jeez. Baby, we need marriage counseling. Anyway, so, so you, I, can't, I can't rely on someone else to make me happy, to make me feel good, to make me feel like, like I'm important, to make me feel like, like I'm valued, okay, to, to, to put in my life where, where this is the only thing that matters is what's feeding me. Let me tell you, at some point, you have to take responsibility for your own life and find out who Christ is inside of you and begin to nurture that because that in return will cause value over your life. And it's not to say you're going to be independent from everyone else because we all need connection and relationships. This is how God did it. Look, l listen to me, listen to me, especially for the men. Men, listen to me, listen to me, men. Just because you're independent doesn't mean you're more of a man if you are. We need connection. We need relationship. We need those things in our life. It's how God created us. But I cannot rely on someone else to make me feel valued and important and worthy. I have to find that in my own space, in my own lawn. And sometimes I've got to get the weed eater out. Sometimes I've got to get the spray out. Sometimes I've got to get, a lot of the times I've got to get the, the, the lawnmower out and cut the grass. A lot of the times I have to take care and manage myself. I have to manage myself. And what happens a lot of the times is we start blaming other people for how we feel. And especially in today's world, they made me mad. Ooh. Well, maybe you were just mad and you got triggered because you don't value yourself the way you should. The reason why people react emotionally is because they're emotionally unstable. That's a good word. Say it again. Thanks, Ashley. The reason why people react is because they're emotionally unstable. They don't know who they are in Christ. They haven't really manicured their own lawn quite yet. So boundaries in relationships and in life are extremely important. It causes you to understand me and me to understand you. But let me say this about boundaries, and we're going to get to the word. It's equally important to not have your boundaries be defined by your wounds. So many people either are extremely recluse or extrovert because they are covering up something they don't want to face. They mask it and they say, this is my boundary. Your wounds are not your boundaries. 
your wounds, the things that have happened to you. When I say wounds, I'm talking about the things that, are hap- that have happened to you over the course of your life that now you think are you, but they're really not. And so what we need to do is have a place where we come to the Lord and say, God, search me. Search me, which leads us to Psalms chapter 139, verses 23 through 24. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. It's important to allow God to search you and clean up the messes that life can bring you. And this is one of the aspects of these encounter weekends that we're taking is we take a moment to highlight, God highlights things, wounds in our hearts that maybe we haven't yet dealt with that we need to deal with in order to better yet manicure our own lawn and take care of us and create boundaries. Kim Clement, anybody know who Kim Clement is? Kim Clement is an old, I don't want to say old, he actually passed away in his mid-60s. He was a prophet, and he would say things like this. He said this all the time. You're somewhere in the future, and you look much better than you do right now. (laughs) He would always sing it to music. You're somewhere in the future, and you look much better than you do right now. Right? See, if we allow God to continue to search us and heal us, we will truly discover the true freedom of what and who we think we really are. And I'm going to say something extremely bold. Some of us thought for a very long time that this is who I am. I was born this way. I'd suggest to you that maybe we haven't truly allowed God to search us and try our thoughts, like Psalms 139 says. Every thought in our mind and in our heart should be held captive to the kingdom of God. Every thought. It cannot raise itself up above the word. And if it does, then we need to bring this before the Lord and we need, an a, we need to say, try me, God. Search me. I am listening. Okay, so we've established that boundaries are important to set in our life, in our relationships, and boundaries look like personal responsibility. That's what boundaries really are. Boundaries are simply personal responsibilities. Now, we talked about how to create these things, creating them, making sure you're taking care of yourself. Let's talk about how to maintain boundaries, okay? Because once we've established that this is my boundary... I'm responsible for myself. I'm responsible for the triggers in my life, if you will. I'm responsible what things make me sad, what things make me angry, what things make me emotional, when things make me upset, when things, you know, most of the time it's with your spouse if you're married. They make you the most upset, right? You're just like, come on, you know, just ugh. Not me and Kristen, though, but I'm just saying that it, 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 <laughs> it, it just happens that way, right? Because they're in your life. You've given yourself to each other. So it happens that way a lot of the times. So we establish, this is me. This is where I start. This is where I end. This is how I am. Okay, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to work on me a little bit. So that way I can be a better me for you. Okay? I also believe that there's things that we can do to maintain boundaries. Okay? Things that we can do to maintain these boundaries. And I'm going to talk about three things very briefly here, of things that we can do to apply to our lives to maintain the boundaries in our life. Maintain these things called boundaries. But I also believe that these next three things can also be weapons of the enemy that can be used against you. Okay? If we fall prey to these weapons, yes, they can be used as creating, maintaining boundaries, or they can be weapons used against you. You guys ready? Number one way to... Maintain boundaries in your life is not to have negative self-talk about yourself. But also, this can be used as a weapon against you. Where, you know, you guys ever heard this term before? Them is fighting words. Right? Someone says something to you. You're like, what? What? Let's go, big boy. Right? It's fighting words. See, it's interesting to me that we entertain thoughts about ourselves that we would never let anyone else talk to us like that. Okay, like this. Would you allow anyone to tell you this constantly over and over in your life? Man, you're just overweight, man. 
you're just no good. Man, you're just a clumsy guy. Would you allow someone to talk to you like that? No, you would have some kind of confrontation with them. Hey, 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 look, you can't say that about me. Right? You can't say that about me. Right? Would you allow someone to tell you this all the time? You always just make bad decisions. You're not good enough to make good decisions. You're not successful enough. You're not good enough to accomplish the task. It's, it's way without your reach. And we're talking like these people in your life who would say these kind of things over you, constantly drone. Eventually, at some point, you're going to get fed up with it, aren't you? At some point, you're going to go, hey, no, look, hey, you and I need to go have a sit down at, at, at Caribou because we need to discuss some things. Because you crossed a boundary in my life, and I'm not going to allow you to speak to me that way. Right? At some point, that will be so redundant in our lives that, that them is fighting words. You know what I mean? You guys with me? They would say things like this to us. Man, you're a failure. You're an awful spouse. You're an awful parent. Man, you're the worst parent in the world to allow your kids to do this, that, and whatever. We would never, we would never sit back and let those things happen to us, right? We would never do I mean, maybe once, maybe twice, but eventually we're going to come up and go, hey, what's your problem, man? You got an issue? We need to handle this somehow? What's going on in your life? Like, what's going on? Why are you saying this to me? Eventually, we're going to say that kind of stuff. But there again, it's interesting that those same words that we would go and have a confrontation about are the same words that we use against ourselves. We have this thing called negative self-talk that goes around in our mind all of the time. It's constantly rolling around. We look in the mirror and we say, man, you're just too overweight. Man, you're not good enough. Man, you're a failure. You're not successful enough. You won't accomplish the task. I'm a bad spouse. I'm a bad parent for allowing my kids to do this. We have all this talk going on right here. And before you know it, this talk now becomes part of our heart. And if it becomes part of our heart, then it begins to come out of our mouth. And we begin to say the same things that we would have confrontations about over our own personal lives. I said this a few weeks ago when we were practicing declarations. A lot of us are declaring over our lives. We're just declaring what the enemy says about us more than we're saying what God says about us. Right? And this happens all the time. When you think about it, to combat negative self-talk, we have to really understand who we are in Christ. Ask yourself this question right now. What is Jesus saying about me? Do you think that God himself, the one who saved your soul, the one who died on the cross, the one who gave himself up for you, do you really think that he's up in heaven going, man, you're awful. Man, you're, you're just a nobody. You can never accomplish that task. You're a failure. You're not successful enough. Look at the way you look. People aren't going to pay attention to you. Oh, by the way, these are the thoughts that roll in my mind. And so these are the things that I have to submit to the Lord and go, God, give me your perspective rather than what I see myself in. Come on, you didn't know that was going to happen, did you? You didn't know that that's the kind of stuff that your pastor has to walk through all the time? And I go, Jesus, help me out. And, and maybe that's a little too, tra too transparent for some of you. But I'm letting you know that the same place and the same shoes that you're walking in are the same shoes that I walk in. Good, and it's extremely important that we begin to understand what Jesus says about us. And begin to declare those things. Why? Because that will help us create and maintain the boundaries in our life. So when someone comes up and combats you and says, you're good for nothing, you're too this, the way you look, the way you handle yourself, the way you do this, however the case is, whatever, they, you, whatever you might hear, whenever they say that, you go, nah, that's not how God sees me. Instead of believing it. <laughs> right? We have to say, no, that's not how the Lord, that's not how Jesus, that's not what he's saying about me. What he's saying about you and what he's saying about me is, Jake, you got this, big boy. You can make this happen. You can do this. You can change and you can transform the people's lives that are in, 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 in your connection with. You can do this. You don't need some extra power. You just need me. God is speaking that over me. So I want to share that and speak that over you. 
Get the perspective of heaven, not your own perspective over yourself. Because I promise you, you will never speak anything positive about yourself. But only if we get the perspective of how Jesus sees us. Negative self-talk will deter you away from your perspective of what God is doing in this season. Negative self-talk will deter you away from your perspective of what God is doing in this season. Boundary number one. Maintain your boundary. Learn who you are in Christ. Let him speak to you. Let him minister. And then recite that. Look in that mirror. Get in your car. Whatever you have to do. When you're out by yourself, you say, God, I may not be feeling this right now, but let me tell you, the way you see me is how I'm going to live. It's how I'm going to act. It's how I'm going to live. I'm going to construct my life by your words, not by what I think. Second boundary, but also weapon, is gossip. I don't think gossip gets talked a lot about in church. (laughs) It's kind of like we just grow comfortable with at the church, right? With, well, you know, it's just my opinion, we say, can I not have an opinion? Look, if your opinion doesn't build other each other up, then keep your opinion to yourself. If it doesn't grow, if it doesn't build, if it doesn't construct someone's life, keep it between you and the Lord. Let him change the way you think about that person. Man, that's, that's a $100 message right there, man. That's good. Gossip in your dictionary says this, casual or unconstrained conversation or reports about other people typically involving details that are not confirmed as being true. When we allow slander or gossip come into our life, we can't and we are unable to anchor our faith into what God is doing and what he wants to do. Let me say it again. When we allow slander and gossip come into our life, we can't and we are unable to anchor our faith into what God is doing and what he wants to do in your life. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 19 says this. A gossip betrays a confidence, so avoid anyone who talks too much. Thank you, Solomon. I appreciate those words of wisdom. A gossip betrays a confidence, so avoid anyone who talks too much. It's not talking, that that verse right there isn't saying avoid anyone who likes to talk a lot, because I like to talk a lot. Okay? I'm talking about the people who just have to spill the tea every single time they're around you. And what that means is gossip. They have to tell you about the next thing that happened to somebody and so on and so forth. And they're just saying, no, that's just how I feel. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Quit your gossip. You can tell someone who's a slanderer or a gossip by their life. Everything goes wrong in their life all the time. All the time. I'm not talking about the little, the, little, the little battles that we face or anything like that, but it seems constant all the time. I would, I, would, I, would, I would say and I would suggest that maybe if that's something evident in your life that you are walking through and it's, you're constantly in battle and you're constantly not getting victory and things are going on, check your tongue. Check what you're saying because you're constructing your life based on what the enemy is saying, not what God is saying. Negativity and gossip are married together. What happens a lot of the times when you gossip or slander, you think that those same people are doing that to you as well, and the cycle never ends. You think, well, so-and-so is saying this about me, even though they may not be saying it, but you think that way. Why? Because what you say is how how you're directed, okay? Book of James put that super clear. The tongue is a small rudder. It directs your life, Okay? You can read it. It's in James chapter 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. <laughs> it's in one of those. <laughs> I know it's not in 5, okay, but it's in one of those. Okay? And so it, directs, it steers the ship. It sets the course of your life. Matter of fact, the, 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 James says this. It sets the course of your life on fire if you choose to. Okay? So that tongue, that thing, and what you think to yourself is actually not even really happening, but it's reality in your mind because that's what you're doing. All right? Think about it. When you slander your spouse to someone or you gossip about another person or another church, usually it means that you are extremely unhappy and you don't value yourself very much. So 
So you say things that are untrue. You say things that are seen through the wrong lens. And the cycle continues in your life. And you never get out of the pit. So let me suggest to you a great idea. Train your tongue. Discipline yourself to be like Jesus. Why? Because having a boundary is responsibility over your life. Yeah, but you don't know what they're saying about me. Who cares? I don't care about what they say about me. I don't care about how they feel about me. I don't care about what's, what other somebody else is saying about our church. I don't care about what they're saying. Why? Because I'm responsible for my own lawn. Amen? Think of it this way. Would you say those things about Jesus? Probably not. If Jesus were standing right here, right, and sitting right next to you, which he, which he is, by the way, spiritually, okay, but if you were sitting right next to you, would you, would you lean over to him and go, yeah, it's Pastor Jake, man, I don't know what he's thinking. Got them white shoes on with them cut off high, those jeans. What is he wearing, man? I don't, I don't know what he's doing. I'm just telling you right now, I'm wearing these because they have elastic bands around my waist, and it feels so good. <laughs> If you need something to talk about, talk about that. <laughs> of course you wouldn't say those things if Jesus was sitting next to you. So learn how to train yourself. Discipline yourself. Take responsibility for yourself. Unfortunately, slander and gossip in today's world sells. Just watch the news a little bit. It's honestly why I stay away from it. Because I'm trying to eat healthy in my life. Yeah, physically. But also, I don't need to be hearing stuff that's not good for me. Right? I'm not saying staying current on what's going on. I'm talking about listening to all the wow. that's out there. Because it's coming from every direction, man. Every direction. And a lot of it is like 0.2%. You know what the lies are today? Did anybody watch that Boston game last night? Boston and, and uh, Boston Celtics and Miami Heat. Anybody watch that game last night? Who watched that game? What an awesome game. Okay, so four of you. Okay, so I'm, this is going to go right to you. Okay? So everything that's out there right now is like when the Celtics scored that 0.3 goal, right? That's how untrue, like that's how true stuff really is. Okay? But when we feed ourselves that kind of stuff, hear me out. When we feed ourselves that kind of stuff, your life now begins to reflect that and you begin to be more negative and gossipy. My grandpa, I told this story in our worship team prayer here before. My grandpa, who's passed away now, and I love my grandpa. He was extremely old school. Old school Hispanic guy, right? Loved it. He passed away when he was 94. He would do this when someone misspoke. No matter who it was, he would have. He would do that. Sometimes you, just need, you need a ch your life. You need a ch your tongue. Yeah, it's there. There's probably six more lined up behind it. Okay? But ch your tongue. Why? Because you're responsible for your own lawn. You've got to take care of yourself. And whatever you do in your lawn is going to grow. Okay? So if you don't want weeds in your lawn, guess what? Don't plant weeds. Don't do it. Don't allow the atmosphere of your life to grow things that are unhealthy for you. I can hear it now. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. Well, stop your yeah, buts. Stop your yeah, buts. There's only one thing to do if we're going to see the kingdom of God advance over your life and over our church and over your personal belongings and your beings, and that's begin to get the perspective of Jesus and speak it. Say it. Declare it from your mouth. And see what God does in your life. I challenge each of you to get a perspective from heaven and say it this week instead of saying the other stuff. I know so-and-so doesn't make you happy. I know they're always late to work. I know that they always take their 10-minute break, but it's really 30. I know that stuff is happening in your life. I know that. But wh who's responsible for you? You are. You are. Stop gossiping about it. Number three, and I'm done. You can start some music back there, buddy, nice and light. A third boundary but also could be a weapon that the enemy uses is a lack of focus on what God is doing in our lives. I believe the enemy right now 
is bringing so much distraction. So much distraction. Oh, we got Hunter Biden's laptop, and we got this, and we got that, and we got all this stuff just swirling. It's like a big pot of gumbo, man. It's just every, it's just throw it all in. There it all is. And the, and, and, and the enemy's just going like this. Oh, yeah. This is going to be so good for you to eat. Now, now, we're talking rotten gumbo, okay? I like the real stuff, okay? We're talking the stuff that's not good for you. It's, he's just twirling all around. And what happens a lot of the times, if we don't maintain our boundary of seeing what God is doing, we'll get our focus lost on what he's not doing. And this is a tough thing to do. Because a lot of us want to focus on the things that he's not doing and say, God, where are you? But let me encourage you this morning to stop focusing on what he's not doing and begin to focus on what he is doing. What is God doing right now in your life? Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Thank you, Brother Paul. Think about these things. Like I said, this is so easy to do because human nature has a tendency to focus on what's not going on rather than what is going on in your life. That's why, again, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience, but rather we're spiritual beings having a human experience. We need to turn our eyes to what he is doing, even in the middle of unanswered prayer. What is he doing right now in your life? And if you can't think, and if you don't see anything that God is doing right now, currently in your life, think about what he has done and begin to recite that. Thank you, Jesus, for providing that one time you did that, even if it was 20 years ago. Thank you, God, for providing that one time. Thank you, God, for doing what you've done. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for whatever. Find something to be thankful for because being thankful creates an atmosphere for the miraculous to happen in your life. And without being thankful, it does not attract heaven's atmosphere over your life. Come on, somebody. When we're thankful, God says, oh, I see you're ready for more. And he goes, and he blows into your life. And then that's when the miraculous begins to take place in your life. That's when that money miracle, the things that we, the things that we declare, the things that, we tie, that when we get up and we do tie, uh, offering declarations, Right, and we say these things, right, and we say, we're not just saying these things because they're a good practice to do. We're saying these things because it attaches faith, and we're being thankful for what he has done, what he's currently doing, and what he's going to do. Why? Because heaven's attracted to that. And when we begin to create the atmosphere of being thankful, heaven goes, yeah, now I'm welcome. Now I'm welcome in your life. Now I see, because what you do with the little right now, God will reward you with the more. But if you can't do anything with the little that you have right now, God says, give it a few more years. I'll, I'll give you when you're ready. The enemy can put you into situations that you flirt with having a negative mindset rather than a faith-building mindset. This boundary for our lives will help us to keep on stepping. When we focus on what God isn't doing, we will lose focus on our mission and our assignment. And eventually, that will lead to burnout. The enemy will do everything to keep your eyes on the negative around you. Get you to focus on it. And see things through his perspective. And a lot of the times, those things sound like this. My spouse isn't. My kids aren't. My job, fill in the blank. My job is so awful, it's so bad, it's the worst job ever in the whole wide world. My church, I know you guys never say this, my church, fill in the blank. You don't preach the Bible enough. My church doesn't preach the Bible enough. My church doesn't worship long enough. My church doesn't have great kids programs like other churches do. Look. Shh. 
What does your church do? My small group, X, Y, Z. Negative, negative, negative. Then we wonder why our lives are never fulfilled. It's like we instantly wake up and see what we can be negative about that day. See, what God is doing in your life right now, what he's doing right now in your life, right now, let's celebrate that, whatever that might be. Thank God my son graduated high school. Praise Jesus. I didn't know if it was going to happen or not, but man, thank God that he's done. Thank God she finished. Thank God for something. Just be thankful for something. When I was a youth pastor, I used to say, be thankful for elbows. (laughs) It's good. Can you imagine that? Be thankful for something. Be thankful. There's something thankful that you can be thankful for in your life. So here's what I want you to do as we close. Mario, did you want to say something? Well, grab that mic. Come on up. Write down on a piece of paper, if you can. Let, let, let's practice this right now before Mario speaks. If you've got a piece of paper with you, okay, or your phone or whatever, okay, grab that out. I want you to write something down right now on what God is doing right now in your life. Okay, just write whatever it might be, just write it down, okay? It can be, it can be like the most, <laughs> it can be the thing that, that, that you may not even think it matters most, but just find something right now to be thankful about, okay? Now, here's what I want you to do. Because we're still in our negative fast, right? This week is the last week, okay? So for the remainder of the week, I want you to take every day and just recite that. Just read it out loud, out loud with your voice. I'm thankful for fill in the blank. I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful for that. And just fill in the blank, whatever it is. And every day, you'll you'll begin to see your perspective start to change. You'll begin to see your mind begin to transform a little bit. Why? Because you're filling your mind up with God's word. That's what's happening. And so you begin to see things begin to transform. And before you know it, at the end of the week, you're going to go, man, that was a great week. Or it may be the absolute worst week of your life. doesn't matter. Why? Because you're maintaining your own lawn. No matter what the outcome is, no matter what happens in the world around me, I'm responsible for this right here. Go ahead, Mario. This is going to be uh, very difficult because I need to take care of my lawn and my, my heart is pounding, but I feel very strongly um, that I need to say this because I didn't want to and that's for me a sign that I have to do this. Um, I've been convicted about um, the effects of gossip um, because a few weeks ago we went back to Illinois for a wedding of a wonderful girl that was on my team when I was on pastor of the church there. And we met so many people, and I found out that a lot of things are happening in the church, and, you know, the truth has always this wonderful um, ability to rise to the surface. And some time ago, uh, a friend of mine from the church called me and said that he had heard some things about me that he knew was gossip. And he said, Mario, I didn't believe any of that, but I feel so convicted that I didn't stop the gossip. And I could allow this to come into my heart. And I don't know how much I believed it or not. I I know you. I don't think I believed any of it. But I should have been more bold. And I should have cut it off. And I I allowed this person to speak into my life. And I I said, everything is fine. And he said, no, I need to apologize. And, And he started crying. And I started looking into my heart and thinking about the example that he gave me. Because what I realized was that I had done the same thing, that I had allowed the pastor's wife to say things. And I understood that I had allowed um, and I had confused loyalty or I had confused being courteous with being bold and say, you know, sister, like Pastor Jake said, shut. And, and, and there were a few people that I had allowed my view of them to be tainted by the gossip. 
And then I realized that I had believed some of the gossip and it had changed my view of them. And so when I was there, I saw one of the brothers and I said, hey, can I speak to you to the side? And I told him the story and I said, a wonderful brother of ours gave me an example, became a role model of what I need to do. And without going into details, I confessed and I asked him for forgiveness for allowing the gossip and for not, have, and for not being brave enough to stand at this moment and say, you know what, if you have something to say about this brother, you go to them. And I just started crying and I said, would you forgive me for allowing this gossip to change my view of you and for not being brave enough? I was weak and I chickened out for the wrong view of here is a pastor's wife and I shouldn't say anything. And I started crying and he hugged me and said, Mario, you are an outstanding guy that I didn't believe. And I said, you know what? And this is why I'm telling this to you. I said, I need to do this for the well-being of my own soul. Please allow me to ask you for forgiveness. And after, I did, and after I did that, there was this weight that was lifted off my shoulder. And I had a list of people. I have one more to go. I called another person and I told him the same thing. And I asked him for forgiveness because I had allowed gossip to enter my ears and my heart. And he said the same thing. And I felt another weight lifted off my shoulder. I felt so free. I have one more to go. If he never picks up the phone, I'm going to jump on the plane and I'll go and find him and I'll do the same thing. Why am I telling you this? I'm not proud of anything that I'm telling you. I also realized that I have gossiped in the form of a prayer request. Is that, does that ring bell to any of you? Because we always spiritualize it to the point where we call it a prayer request. Where we actually don't pray for the person, we just enjoy gossiping. And I think that we need to repent each and every one of us of their own lawn. Because gossip is like cancer. And I guarantee you as someone who has been for quite a few years in ministry, and I know that the pastors would agree with me, that gossip has probably destroyed more churches than all of the other sins combined. Right? Everything including infidelity, whatever you want to put, I guarantee you that gossip has destroyed more ministries, more organizations, and more churches than anything else. And I feel that we need to repent, each and every one of us, for the gossip we have caused and for allowing negativity to come into our hearts and to taint the view of precious brothers and sisters for whom Jesus had died to wash away their blood, their, their sins with his blood, so that we can be bound together in unity. Because this is how we, the world will know that we, that we are his disciples, by loving one another. If I love you, I would not allow gossip to enter in my ears, because that's how much I love you. So well, I do repent. This, Mario. I let's, repent in front of you let's, uh, for my let's, own love. Let's do this, Mario, here real quick. Let's, um, let's do it. Why don't you lead us in prayer real quick for that to happen, okay? And uh, why don't we go ahead and all stand right here this morning. And um, Mario's going to lead us into a, a quick prayer on um, if, if you have, if you've dealt with any of these things, um, negative self-talk, gossip or slander, or lack of focus on what God's doing, but in highlighted is the gossip and slander, now's the time for us to repent. Okay, now is the time for us to turn and change our mind about these things and give it over to the Lord and surrender to him. So I'm going to ask Mara to pray just real briefly for about 15 seconds. And uh, let's, let's, let's do that. Go ahead, man. Before I start the prayer, I want to encourage you to make a mental note of the people that you need to call or see in person and ask for forgiveness. I'm sure that each and every one of us has at least a few people that we can do that with. Let's uh, lift our hands or, or just be in a posture of, of being open and humble. Father God, not we, I repent of the sin of gossip. Lord, I ask you to forgive me that I have gossiped in different forms for peop uh, against people instead of going to them one-on-one. -on -one. First of all, forgive me because I have sinned against heaven. Forgive me that I have gossiped. Lord, forgive me for tainting and putting poison into the ears of people that I have gossiped to. And I have slandered the name of the people 
that were in that conversation. Father, forgive me for not having the boldness and the courage to cut off the head of the snake, of the sin. Because if I had said no, the gossip would have stopped with me. Lord, I pray that you give me the courage to call and text those people to ask them for forgiveness, give them the strength to own my own sin and to repent of it. Dear Lord, from this day, a day before memorial, I ask you to make me a new person of integrity and character and courage and that I'll never ever gossip about another person or another church or anything like that. Give me the courage to say no. Give me the courage to correct my brother or sister and help me to walk in loyalty, in integrity, in courage, and in love for my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, and everyone says...